For those new to the channel, my name is Dr. Martin Rutkowski, and I'm an assistant professor of neurosurgery with expertise in brain tumors. Bob Saget tragically passed away one month ago at the age of 65. He was found unresponsive in his hotel room in Orlando after a night of stand-up comedy. At the time, the circumstances surrounding his death were unclear, but his family and the chief medical examiner in charge of his autopsy just released his results. He succumbed to something called a subdural hematoma. In today's video, I'll briefly explain what a subdural hematoma is, how they form, and why they can be lethal, and what I think happened to Mr. Saget. I'll also briefly review the surgical options we have if they're caught early enough to be treated. It's important to state that I only have as much information as what was released publicly, and this is my interpretation of the coroner's medical findings. Subdural hematomas are something we see very frequently in neurosurgery. So let's revisit what happened to Mr. Saget. He was found unresponsive in his hotel room by security after family was unable to reach him and he failed to check out. There were no signs of trauma or foul play. Apparently his left arm was found across his chest, leaving many to incorrectly assume that he had suffered a heart attack. When someone passes away prematurely, we often think of the primary suspects that can cause sudden death. Cardiac arrhythmias resulting in cardiac arrest, heart attack, stroke, pulmonary embolism, which is a large blood clot in the lungs, and sometimes metabolic causes. This essentially means death from ingested substances, usually illicit drugs, alcohol, or medication overdoses or side effects. Despite well-documented problems with addiction, Mr. Saget's toxicology analysis did not reveal any evidence of illicit drugs or toxins that contributed to his death. Joshua Stephanie, chief medical examiner in the Orlando counties where Mr. Saget passed away, issued a statement saying, in consideration of the circumstances surrounding the death and after examination of the body, toxicology analysis, histology, and a respiratory pathogen panel, it is my opinion that the death of Mr. Saget was the result of blunt head trauma. His injuries were most likely incurred from an unwitnessed fall. A toxicology analysis did not reveal any illicit drugs or toxins. The manner of death is accident. Our condolences go out to Mr. Saget's loved ones during this difficult time. So what exactly is blunt head trauma, and what is a subdural hematoma? Let's get into it. A subdural hematoma is a collection of blood that forms between the surface of the brain and the dura, a tissue layer that normally houses and protects the brain. We all have veins that drain from the surface of the brain into the dura above it, and these so-called bridging veins can be quite fragile, especially as we age. When they rip or tear as a result of trauma, the sheer force causes blood to pool and expand within the subdural space between the dura and the cortical surface of the brain. As the blood fills this potential space and forms a collection or hematoma, it can exert dangerous pressure or mass effect on the brain. Intracranial pressure can rise to dangerous levels and cause someone to fall into a coma. Direct pressure from the hematoma can cause brain dysfunction, as can secondary effects from cellular injury and eventually lost blood flow to the brain as the pressure inside the head overwhelms your heart's ability to push blood past that resistance, resulting in strokes, further brain swelling and injury, and increased pressure. Eventually, patients can fall into a deep coma and then pass away. A number of factors can increase the risk of forming a subdural hematoma. While blood trauma is usually the inciting force, taking blood thinners for other conditions such as irregular heartbeat, prior blood clots, stroke, and for certain implanted medical devices can greatly increase the risk of subdural bleeding and hematoma formation. We also see subdural hematomas more often in older patients, likely from brain atrophy that causes the surface of the brain to shrink away from the dura, and from blood vessels that weaken with aging. Older patients are also more likely to be on blood thinners, further compounding the problem. So what happened to Mr. Saget? The force it takes to cause a subdural hematoma is generally quite significant. As neurosurgeons, we see them most commonly following car accidents, unhelmeted sports or recreational activities, and from direct, significant blows to the head. Generally, the force of these accidents is enough to cause external signs of trauma or injury to the head and scalp, but apparently Mr. Saget did not show any signs of trauma. Now, I don't know his entire medical history, but it certainly makes me wonder if he had other risk factors such as vascular disease or was taking a medication that made it harder for his blood to clot. Generally, the force required to cause a subdural hematoma that results in death is quite significant. It sounds as though Mr. Saget was found in his hotel bed 
meeting his family in the corner to conclude that whatever trauma he suffered, he was able to make his way into bed before passing away. A so-called lucid interval like this is more commonly seen with another type of brain bleed known as an epidural hematoma, but can certainly be seen with a type of subdural hematoma that Mr. Saget had. Whatever accident he suffered, the blood likely pooled over a period of time and caused him to slowly slip into a coma and ultimately led to his death. It's also important to note that many subdural hematomas are small and do not require medical or surgical treatment and do not result in death. Only when they become large enough to exert significant pressure on the brain and cause altered consciousness or brain dysfunction, such as paralysis or seizures, do we worry about performing surgery to remove them. Surgical evacuation of a subdural hematoma is a common neurosurgical procedure. To see what this looks like in person, be sure to check out my prior video demonstrating how we do this in an actual operation. For those who are curious, the steps involve identifying where over the brain a subdural hematoma is, and then making an appropriate incision in the scalp to allow access to the skull overlying that area. A craniotomy or opening in the skull is then performed by first drilling several nickel-sized holes into the skull. A special side cutting drill is then used to connect the dots and a skull flap is elevated off the dura or covering of the brain. When the dura is cut open and flapped upward, the hematoma is immediately apparent. This is removed while taking care not to disturb the brain underneath. And we always look for any veins or other blood vessels that may be actively bleeding and causing the hematoma. When we find these, they are cauterized. If the brain is not severely injured, we close the dura replace the bone flap with titanium metal plates and screws, and sew the scalp back together. In instances where the brain is severely damaged and too swollen to reclose the dura, we leave the bone flap off to allow the brain to swell during the time of the injury. If the brain swells against a bone flap that has been replaced prematurely, this can cause dangerous increases in intracranial pressure and further injury. We can always go back later when a patient is recovered to replace their bone flap. I hope you found this helpful. For more brain-related content and insights into the world of neurosurgery, be sure to check out the rest of my channel. If you like what you see, don't forget to like this video, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you don't miss any future content. Thank you again, Brainiacs, and I'll see you next time.